more so uh, than in younger patients with good quality bone. So let's see if we can get these cases up here. Okay, so I apologize for the x-ray quality. The hospital has made it difficult for us to pull x-rays to share in presentations. So they're a little grainy and we're working on that. But here's a, a bimalleolar ankle fracture that uh, is in about a 68 year old osteoporotic female uh, limited ambulator. Um, and you can kind of get the sense that she has some poor quality bone. The question with these fractures is how do we go about fixing them? Uh, I think there's a lot of options. Um, I think in this particular fracture, the question is, do you need to fix uh, both the medial and the lateral malleolus? Do you use regular plate fixation or can you use, should you use locking plate fixation? Uh, how do you augment the fixation if you augment it at all? Or perhaps in this case, you should just go to a, an intramedullary nail uh, because of the bone quality. Uh, I think probably the, the latter option of a nail is, is extreme. It takes away motion and you're really counting on a fusion. Um, so in this particular case, I elected to fix it through standard means. Here's the interoperative photo uh, where we're using a one-third tubular locking plate. You can see that the fracture has been reduced with a clamp. And uh, ultimately, we uh, secure the, the a buttress type fixation with locking screws, and we get a reasonable reduction of the joint. And I think if you go back and look at this x ray, you see that the medial malleolus fracture is below the level of the axilla. This is a diabetic female, poor quality skin. I guess my question to the group, and perhaps some comments at this point, would be. A, do you agree with the approach? And B, should we or should we not fix the medial malleolus? Any comments? Hello. Here's Guilherme from Pelvis Club. Oh, hello. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah. Professor, in this kind of case, I, pre I always prefer our intramedullary nail because the quality of bone. What do you think about? Well, I think the intermedullary nail is, a, is certainly an option and a good option in a low demand patient. This patient was a, a relatively more, more of a community ambulator. So uh, I think if I can preserve the ankle motion, that might be better in this age group. But I think you're, you're right in a low demand patient who's of advanced age, maybe only ambulates around the house, that might be a really good option. Perfect, I agree with you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, so we can, uh, so there's what it looked like. I chose in this case not to fix the medial malleolus uh, because I thought we had a stable reduction. And uh, so here's where we ended up about six weeks in, or about six weeks into this. So with fixation failure. Mm -hmm total failure. And this, this is my case. I own this case. So the, the intermedullary <laughs> nail, uh, in hindsight, is looking to be a very good option here. So what, what do we do now? No infection, no signs of infection. Um, the skin is okay. Patient's uncomfortable. Probably it's a Charcot arthropathy, isn't it? Yeah, my yes, There's certainly Charcot in uh, the diabetic patient is a is a factor. And when you see rapid failure, I think that that's uh, you know a common diagnosis to make is Charcot arthropathy. So it, it it's with 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 six weeks, it's possible to to try to save the 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 joint. So I too. We made the the, the, the osteosynthesis with uh, a locked plate and augmentation of the synthesis with many screws from fibula to tibia, and with the screws in in medial malleolus, if it's possible to to rebuild the, the joint. Uh, I'd like to to need more more exams, like a probably a, a CT scan or something like this. 
Yeah, I, I, I think uh, that's, uh, I've, having been burned by my own fixation and looking at the impaction of the lateral joint um, and knowing that the bone quality was poor, um, I was not so aggressive in trying to salvage the joint at this point and I opted for the nail. Uh, but I think you make some good points. Um, I think in another patient, maybe without diabetes, I felt like we had one chance to to kind of get this right. So, so we, we, that's the lateral X-ray of the failure. I don't. So we moved on to a to a retrograde calcaneal nail. Um, and so we went ahead and performed a, a primary ankle fusion. Now the question that I have for the group when you do this is how many people choose to formally fuse the subtalar joint? We, we formally fused, attempted to fuse the ankle joint, but how many people decorticate or prepare the subtalar joint for a fusion in this setting? No, I, I never do that. You leave the subtalar joint alone. Nobody, nobody yes. has an answer. Nobody has a question. I have. Okay, okay go ahead, Doctor Isaac. I don't understand why you didn't fix the medial malleolus because because disability, the medial side is very important to disability. I think that if you had to fix the malleolus medial, you don't have this problem. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think you make a good point, and that might have been an error of my judgment. Uh, the reason I didn't fix it uh, was because I felt that we had the fracture was below the level of the axilla, and so that we had containment of the talus on the medial side. Um, that was the reason why I didn't fix it. Uh, I think you can argue the failure pattern here, which is more of an at, an abduction injury with an avulsion here, that I think you're probably right, that this, this was a, you could have conferred some stability on the medial side. I don't know if that would have prevented this rapid failure, but I think in these patients, you're always trying to balance, you know, too much surgery, poor skin quality, poor healing quality, but clearly in this case, you know, what we did here was not enough. Um, I think, I think, if you have put uh, uh, professor, dear professor. an encerclage, uh, tension band, static band, tension band, you would not have this problem. I yeah, think. maybe. You, you uh, might dear be professor, right. I, uh, I would like to make a, a chance to talk about, uh, with these this patients, I prefer to use the, a long plate in the fibular uh, to put uh, some screws uh, passing through uh, until uh, 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 like a, a plate uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long plate we've put some screws in, the, in this place and not put the screws in the others in the other holes okay it's a yes. long to to fill the, the to distribute the 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 the, the, the strength uh, along the plate. So I think what you're referring to is the technique of where you use a plate and you place long screws to gain additional fixation into the tibia. Yeah. Uh, to keep the plate from pulling away. Yeah. Other techniques would also be it would include um, say additional K-wire fixation intramedullary in combination with the plate. That would be another option, I think, here. Um, all viable options in poor quality bone. So I think points well made. Now, what I wanted to point out is this, this, is, uh, this did go on to fuse. We confirmed that with a CT scan. Um, there is a total knee above this, so it's a shorter nail. Um, but what I wanted to point out is here's the initial post-operative X, um, and things look good initially. But probably um, we will have uh, a big stretch around along the tibia, the tibia medullar tibia, and probably fracture 
uh, in the media ulterior. Probably will, it will be. Yeah. Well, I wanted, this is the more, I think we're about three to four months out here, but look at what happened here. So you can see the total knee above, but with early ambulation after surgery, the nail fixation in the talus and calcaneus failed and the nail became proud in the bottom of the foot. And a uh, patient complained of pain. So my point here is even if we use the most aggressive approach early on, the bone is always probably the biggest factor here. So the compression that occurred into the tibia probably allowed us to achieve a good fusion here, um, but we still ended up with prominent hardware. And I think one of the challenges of retrograde nailing is particularly in poor quality bone is we all don't always get good fixation in the, in the calcaneus or the talus. So ultimately this fused, uh, we took the nail out. I don't know if I have, I don't have a picture of that, but things went, went well after that. But I think this represents a lot of challenges in the lower extremity, particularly in ankles. But I'm open to your criticism. This is my case, my decision-making, my salvage. I have no one to blame but myself. <laughs> hey, Steve, if you want, you can go for the next case because... Okay. Uh, You're a very okay. brave man. Yeah. So here's a... This is a proximal tibia case. Um, I got a lot of things going on here, but this gentleman is uh, a diabetic male, uh, comminuted interarticular proximal tibia fracture. It was closed. Uh, with a very prominent piece of medial cortex pushing against his skin. Um, relatively low energy mechanism, if I recall correctly, just a, a trip and fall uh, coming down some stairs. Um, gentleman's about 74 years old. So any comments on how to approach this initially, long term? From, from the participants. I would like to, to, make, to, to put an, a circular hybrid external fixation, fixation with a, 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 a ring in the proximal tibia and a, probably to, pick, to put a, along the tibia two, two or three uh, screws with uh, like a uh, monolateral. Okay. So like a, a, a hybrid frame. Yes, that's it. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Thank you. So avoid an incision altogether. Go for a hybrid frame, stretch things out. Um, certainly an option. Uh, I think, you know, I always get concerned about hybrid frames and, and diabetic patients, but it's certainly possible to manage them that way. Any other ideas? Okay, well, I'll, I'll show you what we did. I, we went ahead and initially, we just put a spanning fixator on. Uh, we weren't in love with this fracture fragment that wouldn't really come out to length here. So we made a small incision here and just pulled the fragment out. And uh, at that point to get the tension off the skin. Um, but now what? Anybody going to plate this? Is that what the group would do? Put a plate on there, make an open incision. How many people for that versus a percutaneous plating? Any idea? Yeah, go ahead. Any comments there here is on a, this? There is a, I, think, uh, I don't see, uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing. But there is a, a thick of a, a fracture in between the two sides. I don't see it. Do you have the oblique wheels? No oblique films. I, I'm not giving you very much information, I guess. I didn't show you the CT. I will tell you the fracture into the joint is relatively non-displaced. And again, uh, an older gentleman's mid-70s diabetic. I would put double plate, one in the middle side and one in the lateral side, both okay. with blocked screws, locked screws. 
locking Ooh. screws, medial yes. plating, locking fixation. Okay, all good ideas. Um, I, I worry about the number of incisions. So in this case, we took them to the OR, we got rid of the offending bone. Um, we actually allowed him to impact here and shorten. And we utilized a percutaneous plating technique with a locking plate and in the shortened position. And we used the plate as an internal fixator. Um, we used the plate with some standard screws to affect the reduction into an optimal position. And ultimately fixed him in a shortened position to try and gain some stability uh, in the area of metaphyseal comminution. So that's how we chose to treat it. So we actually like not dissimilar to what you might do in a proximal humerus where you may allow the shaft to impact into the head if you want to achieve some stability from the fracture itself. So tell me how many people think this might fail? I do. Okay, so you're voting, you're voting against me again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would fix Which the middle okay. side. Which is okay. I didn't bring all my <laughs> failures today, though. <laughs> Just a few of them. Yeah. Uh, but this guy actually um, did okay. So he did, because he was recumbent a lot, I think in these older people, particularly in the diabetics, you got to worry about positioning and heel, protect, heel protection. He did develop a heel decubitus ulcer, which wasn't really our goal. We were trying to get him to walk. Um, that eventually declared itself. But just to point out in our elderly patients how important it is to take care of the whole extremity and the whole patient and uh, be aware of these complications. So it wasn't a complete success for me. Um, and here you see it resolving over time and eventually it went away. Uh, but here he is. Um, I think this is, I, I can't see around the, what's going on here. I can't, how many weeks post-op does the slide say? Six. Six weeks. Six. So you see at six weeks, we're maintaining the reduction in the shortened position, but he's making a lot of bone. Um, so from my standpoint, his wounds are closed. He's not draining. His joint looks good and reduced and he's making bone in the shortened position and the fixation looks intact. So here he is again, I can't see my top slide, but I think we're further out probably at three months. Five months. How many? Five. Five months, yeah. And so we think he's healing. And I know you know that sometimes in the geriatric fracture patient, the x-rays look a little ugly, but we gotta remember we're not cosmetic surgeons of the x-ray, we're functional surgeons. And so the whole guy, idea here is to get this guy moving. And so here he is at, um, we'll see if we can get this to run. This is his clinical results at five months. Like I said, an older gentleman and he's ambulating with his walker. And uh, pretty functional, um, happy patient and doing pretty well. So congratulations. Not the congratulations to him, I think, not to me. <laughs> I just yeah. feel like I dodged another bullet. Oh, um, you, you, you but I think solution. here it's it's fair to say in some of these fractures, you know, shortening them is not a bad idea, uh, particularly in a comminuted fracture if it confers some stability, uh, because then you're getting the bone to share part of the load. Um, but I, I would it would be great to hear some comments. In yes. my opinion, it's a, he, 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 you have a very good solution for this case. Uh, and they were very happy. The problem with the patient is very happy too. Yeah, I, I get a little worried. I mean, I think the challenge here about the two plating, and you can certainly do it with percutaneous techniques and get some stability, but I think we have to be really careful with, uh, you know, balancing our what our x-rays look like and the amount of stability that we were trying to achieve um, with avoiding wound healing problems or inducing, you know, biologic damage. It's always a balancing act. Um, and sometimes we win and sometimes we don't. Okay, so here, 
is what's becoming not an uncommon problem uh, in the geriatric or the fragile yes. patient, and that's some sort of some sort of arthroplasty in the upper extremity and an associated periprosthetic fracture. So this is a, a, a an older female uh, patient, uh, previous uh, fracture here, or a previous uh, reverse total shoulder, and uh, a fracture around the tip of the prosthesis. So what does anybody do with this? I don't think we're gonna put a longer prosthesis in there, and I'm not sure I'd recommend that, but I suppose one option is non-operative management. Um, and always a discussion as to when that's good and when that's bad. Uh, and then the other option is some form of operative fixation. Any thoughts? And of course the challenges are where do you get the fixation at with that giant prosthesis? I know there's some upper extremity surgeons in the audience. What, what, what are the joint surgeons that do reverse total shoulders do with this? Clearly you must be seeing this. No, go yeah, ahead. I would like to put, uh, if you have some kind of struts, you need to put struts like uh, uh, plates with uh, circlage, circlage mm -hmm. around over there. Okay. okay, yeah, I think that that's certainly an option. Um, and uh, I always, when operating around a prosthesis, I, I, I will be the first to admit I don't circlage cabling in the femur or in the humerus always scares me a little bit uh, no, for two okay. reasons. I get worried about the, the, neuro, the neurologic structures um, and I get worried that uh, I'm not gonna be as biologic friendly as I wanna be, um, but I always am prepared to, to, to use circlage cables, but it's not my first choice. Not being a, a joint replacement surgeon uh, by you know total profession, um, and more of a trauma surgeon, I always worry about the struts and the dead bone. And I think that that's maybe a trauma surgeon bias, um, but uh, it's not, never my first choice. It's not, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just my, my personal bias is to try and fix things with what's there and avoid the struts. Um, so that what being said, Sorry, what do you no, think no, about a, a bridge plate with uh, uh, circlage around uh, along in superior part close to the prosthesis? Yeah, I think that this is a, I think that that's the, probably the option is a bridging plate around this prosthesis and maybe some cabling up here, but what I would point out is, is that we should look at what we have in our plating armamentarium that might help us avoid surclage cabling. And so one of the things that I've discovered over time with these prostheses is if we have the ability to use variable angle locking screws, um, sometimes we can get around the prosthesis. So I, in the upper extremity, I've looked for plates um, from different parts of the body that might help me achieve this. And um, the, the trouble is we don't always have variable angle locking options in plates that are long enough. And so um, one of the plates I've come up to use is a, a distal tibia plate, like the medial tibial plate because the, the screws, depending on the design up in the shaft, have some variability in where you place them. And so I've liked using this plate to do what you said, perform a bridge plating. And then I've been able to, to date anyways, avoid augmenting with circlage cables or wires proximally at the prosthesis because I've been able to get the fixation on one side of the prosthesis or the other. Um, but one of the challenges with the plates is that it, since it's not a broad plate, it's hard to, sometimes the screws only wanna line up on one side of the prosthesis. So I worry a little bit about a stress riser. And obviously, if you have a cemented prosthesis, it's easier to get fixation you know, closer to the intramedullary canal. Um, but I think this is a good, way to think or a, a good solution potentially for these fractures is to use if you have access to a variable angle 
a locking plate that's long, you can avoid the cerclage cables. So that's how we approach this. And we're developing a small series of cases. And you can either place the plate, you know, in the direction that it's placed now with the broad part down distally, or sometimes the broad part in, say, a hemiarthroplasty can go proximal and the shaft can come distal. So I don't think it really matters how you place the plate. The key is really having variable angle locking screw fixation to try and get around these prostheses. So this yeah. is a, a plate placed the opposite direction in another yeah. case where we place the plate proximally and placed a lot of fixation, you know, with a shorter reverse shoulder up here. And this, these yeah. cerclage cables were previously placed, not placed by me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but so, this is a, a, a you you make it a rigid solution for this. Uh, there is no very important for biological solution to put the screws uh, more uh, so far from mm, what this, this with this case or do the opposite. Put very close to the to the screws. What do you yeah, think about? I think yeah, I think you're, what you're saying is, is for, you know, maybe we need more of a bridge plate and more motion for fracture healing to occur here. Um, in this previous case, I think we do have a pretty long zone of comminution here. Mm -hmm. So I would argue that we've left enough flexibility here. Okay. I think, again, in the, in the geriatric fracture population, it's all about, I'm not sure you can ever have enough fixation. So in the ankle, clearly I had, I did not have enough fixation, not enough fixation into the tibia. Uh, the participants tonight have criticized me for not fixing the medial malleolus. So there clearly I didn't do enough. Here I think when you talk about bridge plating or creating biologic friendly fixation and motion at the fracture site, I think you really have to do it with the length of the plate here. Um, okay. And not nece and necessarily you know, I don't think you should uh, cheat on the number of screws you put into the poor quality bone. Um, so maybe a longer plate and screws further away from the fracture site. But I would just caution you that I don't think you, you can't get enough fixation in poor quality bone. That's okay. all I would say. And, and I do see here we have a pretty long segmental section of fracture here. So that should be enough, I think, to get secondary bone formation. But perhaps you're right. The criticism here is maybe I should have used a longer plate and with a more simple fracture and moved the screws further away. I don't think this patient came back, so I can't, so I don't know if it worked or not. Um, but just wanted to illustrate a lot of different techniques and using plates made for different parts of the body because in the end, they're just plates. And, but if we think hard enough, we can find other uses for them. Other comments? So hopefully this gives you some ideas for the upper extremity periprosthetic fractures. Here's just a, another x-ray of another case, I think. Again, here we did go for absolute stability in this case with lag screw fixation. And uh, there again, you see a long plate. And here, clearly, we did not go for bridge plating. I mean, we went for absolute stability. So just some thoughts before we move down to the proximal femur. So here's a, I would say not an uncommon, not an uncommon problem in the US, which is a, a, a fracture of the proximal femur with a loose prosthesis. I think in this case, this was a hemiarthroplasty. And uh, I have a technique uh, for dealing with these that, you know, maybe is a little beyond fracture fixation. But when I see a loose prosthesis, um, I always think about a revision prosthesis, and I think about using the revision prosthesis as a nail. Um, so I like a long prosthesis, and I want to deal with the fracture in this area at, with an intramedullary device. So that's why I choose a long prosthesis. And here you see, in this particular case, the, the revision component. And I think what started out as a relatively simple fracture pattern in poor quality bone uh, went south very quickly because when we were trying to do the revision case, 
we ended up with some additional fracture fragmentation down the leg. And so eventually you run out of room uh, with what you can do here. So you see, you see a surgeon in trouble here in poor quality bone because you start to see a lot of different things happening. You see cerclage cables, and then you see if you look closely, eventually we had to cement this prosthesis in to try and get some stability. So the, the moral of this story is, is that even when you have the best intentions of using a intramedullary device, sometimes in poor quality bone, you need to use everything you have at your disposal, even if that's not what you intended. So the cerclage cables, the cementing technique to get stability, to allow early ambulation. Here's another case that went a little bit differently. I think these prostheses are difficult because they're wedge shaped. If they don't get bony ingrowth over time, they act like a wood splitting device. And if the patient falls or stumbles, they just split their whole femur. Clearly this is not well fixated. And in this case, here you see the technique where we use, we do use some cables to reconstitute the intramedullary canal. And then we use the device like a nail uh, for this part of the fracture. And we get stability different di distally. But again, here's my use of cerclage cables judiciously placed and early weight bearing. Any comments on these two cases? Anybody do anything differently? I don't think you can. <laughs> so ultimately, uh, sometimes these things heal even with good technique and sometimes they don't. Um, oh, so here's a case that I think is interesting. So this is a, a periprosthetic acetabular fracture. Uh, and this is on a young patient. So this patient was sent to me, they did the hip replacement, they recognized a, a, a post-operative complication. So what do you do with this? This is relatively acute, you see the staples are in place one day after this fracture. Uh, I think, you know, six, like a 65 year old retired school teacher is what this was. What do you do with this? Oh, probably I used to make a revision on the acetabular. Probably put a reconstruct, reconstruct the acetabular uh, wall, maybe with a Burr Schneider, and to put in a different uh, cup over here. Maybe be, okay. maybe with uh, uh, strut or or hydroxyapatite strut. Okay. And uh, probably, or a kind of Burr Schneider. Okay. So and you would do that all, all at once. You'd, you'd fix the fracture and put a, put a new acetabulum in there. Yes, yes. Cemented into new, the, the, the uh, cage. Probably cemented it, probably cage, cemented. Yeah, okay. Other comments or techniques? Uh, maybe we can use... Uh, Trabecular marrow, I think is better than uh, Schneider. Okay. So you, so you would fix the acetabulum or just push the trabecular metal into the... Uh, I use it to put uh, bone graft. Okay. And I associate with the uh, trabecular metal. Okay. All right. Reasonable. Any, any other comments? So I, I get a little worried about, I don't, in geriatric fracture patients with acetabular fractures, I think, you know, for the older patient, maybe fixing the fracture and doing an acute total hip might be reasonable in special circumstances. But in younger geriatric fractures, even with poor quality bone who came to see their surgeon for a joint replacement for arthritis, I'm really thinking about how can I get them the best joint replacement outcome possible. And so I worry a little bit about doing all the things that were mentioned um, and not getting a stable acetabulum. So what about fixing the fracture and waiting on doing the, the revision acetabulum? 
Does anybody, anybody think about doing that? Because I always worry a little bit if you put a cup in there and you put a lot of pressure across the hip joint, you know, is it really going to, are you going to really get stable fixation even if you use trabecular metal? So I have a technique I learned from one of my mentors that I consider using occasionally. And so I, this patient also, for whatever reason, after their initial surgery, by their initial surgeon had a post-operative sciatic nerve palsy that developed over time. Um, and so what we ended up doing is she was transferred to us and uh, this was the amount of displacement at the time of transfer. So you see things are moving. Um, and so my thinking was, let's decompress the sciatic nerve. So we opened her up and there really was no hematoma there. So probably a traction injury. And then I took the acetabulum component out mm -hmm. and I fixed the acetabulum. And then I filled the acetabular hole with antibiotic impregnated cement. Uh, and I took the loose prosthesis out and capped the femur. And so I didn't want any pressure on the acetabulum. And the reason I took the femur out is that I knew when I was going to revise this, I was going to want to have a component that allowed me to dial in some, some rotation, some antiversion, so I could create stability in the hip. So simple plates, a reasonable reduction of the acetabulum, not perfect. And we allowed that acetabulum to heal over time. And then we came back, we confirmed healing with a CT scan. And then we went ahead and, and in a delayed fashion, I believe three months after the fact, we performed a revision hip replacement and we used a modular prosthesis so we could dial in antiversion to create stability to prevent dislocation. And so that was how we approached that case. So I, I like that technique on younger patients who can tolerate having to use a walker or have some limited ambulatory status even in poor quality bone. And I think it works out pretty well to get a stable replacement later, but uh, open to your criticisms. You won't hurt my feelings. Uh, Dr. Steve, during these three months from the first surgery to put the, the hemertropocy, did you left the patient with any kind of traction? No. No? No. Uh, free, very, free very tough lady from from the the farming community. She she went home. Uh, she ambulated on a walker. Um, we did allow her to shorten. I think this, you know, shows you the degree of shortening here that she had at the time of revision. So you're right. They definitely shorten. Um, but since she's been living at an at length state. And this wasn't going to be a long period of time. Generally, you don't have to worry about significant contracture or nerve injury when you bring them back out to length. Okay. Um, I like the cat. I like the cement for a couple of reasons. It makes the revision surgery, the revision hip replacement. All you have to do is find the cement, and the cement preserves the acetabular socket, so you don't have to spend a lot of time digging the tissue out of the acetabulum, and the same on the femur side. Um, other options, if you're worried about this pushing on this, you can put a plate across the front of the acetabulum, or if you chose to revise the acetabulum at the time of the fracture fixation, but you wanna keep the pressure off of it, you can put a plate across the, the front of the acetabulum to try and protect your to try and create a jail to keep people out of the acetabulum. But I, I haven't found that necessary to do. And, uh, and the patient did well. Uh, I would like to, to know, Steve, I would like to know about uh, long stems for revision. Why you, you prefer this short, uh, short uh, revision uh, uh, for uh, Femoral uh, piece, stem. You, you mean in this, this case, you think yeah. it's too short? Yeah, I, I think so. 
Well, I don't know, but because the anticurvatum of the, the, the femur, or what do you prefer not so long? Well, until... yeah, so this patient got, a, I think we used, I used probably an even longer stem than I would have ideally used because we had a, fra a crack here that developed at the time of the revision. Yeah. But one of the problems with these stems, um, these revision stems, is that they, they don't match the bow of the femur very well. So in the older patient with a periprosthetic fracture, when you, if I can back up here, uh, if that's okay, um, in these patients here, these stems aren't bowed very well. And as you know, in the, in the older osteoporotic patient, these stems can impinge on the anterior cortex and actually cause a fracture over time or a stress riser. <laughs> yeah. So um, I really wish that this design was a little bit different. I wish they would make a, a bowed stem as opposed to a bend. You know, they put an acute bend in the stem, but it's yeah. never enough distally. So uh, I try to at least get two and a half diameters below the fracture, but that one of the problems with the super long stem is that anterior impingement of the cortex. And I think that's a, that's a problem. See here, see on the lateral x-ray, it's, yeah. it's not a straight stem. Um, they put a bow in it up here or about right here, but it's never enough. And so it, the longer the stem, the more you're pushing on the anterior cortex. So that's why I try to avoid they, uh, a longer they, stem they, if I can. Yeah. Some of them, uh, they have a, a, a stems with bowing, with yes. anterior bowing, no? Yeah, there, there, there are some out there that you can use, and that might be a better stem. Yeah. What but approach do you, what approach do you really, really use? This posterior? Posterior. Or, or what approach? Um, well, in these you. periprosthetic fractures, I tend to use the approach that was used for the initial placement of the stem but if I if I have a choice or if they did a if they did a an anterior approach originally I'll try and stay anterior okay um, because it just really minimizes the, the dislocation risk um, but I think the the one advantage you have of a modular stem is is that you can dial in the, the rotation that you want so okay. if you end up with a posterior approach, I think it's very important to have modularity so you can anavert the stem to prevent dislocation. It's a poroscoated stem? Yes. Well, it's a, it's a ridged porous coated stem, grit blasted stem distally. Okay. This particular device. Okay. Thank you very much. Indeed. Sure. Well, I would just say thanks for, uh, for uh, entertaining my presentation and joining in. Hopefully I've, Showing some, uh, showing my humility and and letting you know that I have failures and uh, we all have failures. I think that that's how we learn is uh, we learn through experience. And so I wanted to share that uh, my failures with you and some of the other things that I've learned along the way that I hope help you in your practice for taking care of what I think is a very challenging group of fractures. Anybody can operate on on good quality bone, but it takes a real surgeon to take care of people with poor quality bone. And uh, hopefully you got something out of this and learned a few tricks.